Right. Um, right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me well? Yeah. Right. Good. Uh, so, hi. Uh, I'm Mark. I'm currently working at Vicky, basically streaming uh, Korean drama. Um, um, and uh, today, I'm going to talk about Database SQL. Right. Uh, the top tight subtitle would be uh, Then Back Again, just uh, a cue to uh, the Hobbit movie. Uh, and today, we're going to take a look at uh, how the um, SQL code in Go work, and uh, we're gonna journey from the code to the uh, backend database, which I will be using Postgres and back. So hence uh, that title, right? Um, so uh, the motivation for the talk uh, comes from um, one of the stuff that I currently do. So we stream movie um, in Viki, and we have around eight to nine million user, uh, and a lot of our code path actually touch. Um, um, upon the database, right? Uh, so earlier this year, we have uh, a quite a severe outage where um, a lot of, um, due to high demand, a lot of our service ran out of DB connection and uh, causing the site to go down. Um, so as uh, we was able to mitigate it, but um, as part of that, we realized that we don't understand um, the code that we use um, to interact with the database enough uh, so that we can prevent uh, certain outage from happening in the future. So reliability, reliability was a concern. And uh, hence, I did a bit of investigation and um, on how the um, Go code actually work for database. And uh, I'm going to share some of these findings today. Right? Uh, so please note that uh, most of this will be uh, based on Go 1.7. And uh, Go 1.8 have a lot of changes, uh, positive change. And I think um, one of the talk later would address that. Right. So, um, so the basic uh, API for working with SQL in Go is pretty simple. Like on the stuff that, uh, like what you see on the left side here. Uh, how so? Basically, you just open supposedly a connection to DB, run some query, scan the result. It looks incredibly simple, but uh, if you dig deeper into the source code, uh, you would actually see that there are many things that uh, is abstracted away from you. So for example, um, you created a pointer to that DB struct. It's gonna be shared across uh, multiple Go routine. How does, um, is there any kind of synchronization um, so that these Go routine can make use of the database, for example, that's one. Uh, how does your code actually um, come from uh, taking the argument, which is um, um, data represented as Go type in uh, memory and translate that to so that uh, it can speak with the uh, database. And then uh, other things like um, what kind of resource does this code actually use? Does, how much memory does it consume? How much um, DB connection does it actually consume? And how does it behave at scale? So all these uh, details are abstracted away from you using Go incredibly simple API. Uh, most of the time, that's all you need to know. but when uh, you start to run things at scale, and then when you start demand reliability, then um, you need to go back into this question. And um, so we're going to go with the most straightforward approach, uh, tracing the code, um, and uh, trying to see how uh, Go does that. Right? So, um, so as starter, I'm going to have, um, so I have a basic database with, uh, I have uh, one table that I'm going to be writing to. So GDP table, pretty lame name. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry. Right, sorry. Okay. Yeah, the screen. Okay, let me. <coughs> All right. Okay. Right. So uh, this is basically the database. So just a table with two column. Um, the first column ID is uh, of a type, an enum time. I, I'm going to use Postgres as a uh, backend here since um, it's one of the popular ones. Um, so let's see. Uh, so just to see what does it entail. Uh, uh, right. So, um, so it's just an enum with two uh, value. Uh, and then uh, the table has three columns. Uh, one is that type. Uh, one is just an integer that can be null. And then uh, one, another one is a timestamp that uh, is generated at uh, insertion time. Right? And then uh, the code that I'm going to use for demonstration today is just like this. 
So uh, just ignore the the go to thing. That that is my note. Um, so it's just simple. Open a connection. Gonna write some uh, entry into DB. So we're gonna use this query. So this will insert an entry. At the same time, it's gonna do a select and return the inserted value. And then we're gonna scan it. So again, very simple thing. But uh, once you go deep into the source code, then it turns out quite complicated. All right. So um, so we'll start. Um, okay. Change back. So at high level, this is. Uh, let's. Uh, okay. So. Um, okay. At, so we'll start here. Um, we're gonna open supposedly a connection to Postgres with this uh, data. Um, so and uh, let's dive deeper into the code. Um, so tell me if uh, it's hard to read so that I can change it somewhere. So uh, for this uh, sample code, what I have done is I make a copy of database SQL uh, source. Uh, put it into the vendor folder and uh, do some modification on it so that we get some logging information out as opposed to the normal one. Um, so we'll start from here. Um, so the open cone that you see here will um, go to uh, this place. Right. Can you see? Right, and then um, it's gonna do a few uh, checks, but ultimately it returns you a struct uh, with some information like what the driver is, where is the data source, and uh, there's two important things. Um, and then it starts something called a connection opener. So if you look at this, this is simply just a loop on a channel. Whenever there's a signal sent to the channel, then you open a new DB connection. So so actually, what we believe to be connecting to Postgres actually doesn't do anything at all, just returning you the struct. And it only uh, happened much later, right? Um, so let's go down further. So um, we got to here. So here we execute a query, right? So this is where the meat of on the database SQL thing is. Um, Right, so this, let's go one, two, five, eight. So this is where it started, um, and there'll be a lot of commands uh, you see later. Um, so it called uh, the query function, query function called something called query context uh, with a uh, background context. So basically, that's just a normal uh, query. Um, and then this come down to um, here. One, two, six, three. <coughs> um, right, this is a transaction. Right here. Um, right, and uh, um, so what it does is uh, for maximum bad retry connection. Re um, I mean, so for, for the value of this variable, it would try to query, uh, run the query. And this is set to two um, as a constant. So interestingly, instead, like what, what we perceive as a query actually get executed twice maybe, right? Um, and then uh, it called this uh, small query function, which goes to here. And um, here, um, the online 1263, we get we actually get a DB connection and execute a query on that. So again, details is a, a lot more fuzzy. And um, how does this work? Um, so let's go deeper into that function. Um, right, so... Uh, feel free to stop me anytime if uh, you have question. Um, so basically, um, what it does is uh, trying to get a database connection, and um, um, at some point later, it will call uh, 
driver dot open so that uh, so maybe I, I'm jumping a bit but ultimately if you trace the cone it come back to here driver dot open um, and this is where it cone the uh, actual driver so the standard lib database code doesn't really understand how to talk to a different database at all uh, it relies on things like libpq to interact with those um, so then again we need to go into that to understand it and uh, we are here um, so coming to here following it here and uh, so basically trying to uh, dial an actual connection to uh, Postgres so the way um, the way Postgres work is that um, you will have multiple clients so which is basically your go code here that will connect to the database through a persistent TCP or uh, connection or through a unit socket right and then uh, then you will start the connection so it will start by um, so um, the client will stream data to the backend and uh, it will do a few things like establish the connection, set up SSL, the server will authenticate and then it will say that it's uh, ready for command, for query and then the client will send command. So this is where um, back in the code Um, so this is where uh, within the code that um, we actually execute anything All right so All right. so we are back here we are back here and we are back on this line. So we establish a connection and then execute the query. So what does this do is, um, so a few important part is um, Postgres doesn't understand the data type that you have in your pro Go program. So for example, we in our program we have, um, we insert uh, something like um, uh, the ID and the num a number and this um, the type is a country type which wrap around an integer and the other one is a C code now in uh, 64 so these are not things that Postgres understands so the uh, driver we have to serialize this um, so what it does it in this uh, driver argument function which I'll go into details later so we'll uh, skip this for now and then uh, it will run the query Postgres will process it um, it will return with uh, some information so particular to Postgres how it works is that it's gonna return um, a few piece of data to you uh, think of it like a table so it first need to describe the table send the data over uh, say that the command is complete and it's ready for more query and um, in particular um, so for Go um, Right, so um, so in, in the code, we run the query and get a row's return, right? So, oh, sorry. Right. Right, so here. Right, so what go store, um, so it store a few more things, but the important part is the driver row, and in Postgres, this uh exactly store the information that we have seen earlier um, which is um, right which include like what what is the column what are the name what are the type there's something called uh, uh, the OID of the type so the type identifier file in Postgres, the format, which might be text or binary, and then uh, we will call the scan function um, in our Go code to um, pass this information out. 
right um right so back here so we we are somewhere around the line uh, 57 finish the query handle some error and try to uh, close the connection and so on um, then we try to scan the uh, go try uh, the, the data return by Postgres into uh, our struct again um, what Postgres return is not understandable by go so then need to be some conversion um, so unlike the normal driver um, code that you would see I don't really need to do a uh, typecast here I can naturally sub in the uh, uh, custom type that I have declared um, so this is because we have declared the uh, conversion elsewhere and uh, I'm gonna go through that later all right but ultimately um, ultimately um, there's four step and then um, so serialize send the query get the result in the postgres format and then deserialize that to the go type right and then uh, let's talk about how those things actually happen so um so there's one very useful package if you write a lot of sql code is the driver uh, package include with sql so this allows you to define your own conversion of uh, go custom type into um, the form that understand by the db right so for example i start with uh, the um so the method the method value here implement the valuer interface and uh, what it does is it convert your custom type into the y format so this um goes here so earlier, like I showed you the function called uh, driver argument, right? So that convert the uh, go type into the y type. Um, so basically, eventually it led to here, where it tried to detect if your custom type implement a value interface, which we did by declaring this, and then uh, do a casting. So without this, then you have to write your own uh, casting function um, like for your custom type and it will be pretty ugly for your database code so that's one uh, the other one is when you scan data um, so again um, the so let me go back to the connection um, just a sec right so scan function here um, eventually will reach to um, so it read the data do some again do some check and then uh, finally the important part is is con convert aside so this transform the postgrad data into go again right so this uh, ultimately go back to here where um, it do a lot of checks um, so just in simple term then what it's trying to do is detect the type that post postgres send and then if it's one of the basic <coughs> type then try to cast try to cast it back to go if not um, then it will utilize things like uh, the scan scanner interface that we declare here so this would be somewhere here so we go down to uh, 241 so there's actually a lot of checks for that we go down to uh, here where if uh, you implement a scanner which uh, we did on uh, line 14 over here and then it will try to do a scan and uh, pass the data into the scanner function right and then uh, for us because the, the the type we have is pretty simple it's just uh, um, the data in Go is an integer. The data in um, Postgres return for this uh, particular thing is a string representing the enum. So I just cast it back to string and map it to the uh, corresponding value. But um, if you have more complex data type, it's possible to convert uh, map, slide, uh, anything you can think of into something that um, Postgres have. 
So this is very useful if uh, you are making custom use of uh, your database. Um, like I'm making use of the enum here that usually not available uh, for raw SQL. Right. So uh, in the end, what it does is um, it helps you um, clean up the code and um, utilize things that uh, the database provides. Right. So, so far we have talked about what happened when you do query and uh, we have seen the context in one particular TCP connection to Postgre. What happened when you run um, concurrent workload? For example, you have a web server that uh, receive lots of requests and on these interact with the DB, right? So, uh, so as I mentioned um, earlier, um, the connection to Postgre only get created when you run a query when you don't have enough connection then um, um, so what what you get from the the sql db is actually a connection pool and uh, it will detect whenever you don't have enough connection it will send a message to this thing the opener channel and uh, that would trigger a function to establish a real uh, tcp connection right uh, so code wise here uh, i don't think it's uh, so i mean you can go through the code. Uh, I'm going to send the slide later. So if... Uh, Does the pool ever shrink? Uh, yes. So um, the pool in uh, that basic work, um, something like uh, with, with some cleanup mechanism like GC. So when you have finished using a connection, it will mark it as uh, unused, uh, return it to pool. Um, send, then you have something like um, you can configure how many idle connection you can keep at, the, at one time. And uh, if uh, a next, the next um, is this configured at the driver or at the SQL level? The SQL level, and yeah. So if if you have configured that, um, and then a uh, uh, request for connection come in, and this is free, then you get it. Otherwise, it will try to create a new one. Right. Um, so um, I mean, these these are just theory. That's not very interesting. So what I have tried is uh, I have made a workload simulator. Um, to send different workload to um, uh, the database, so um, right. So there's a program, but I don't think you really gonna be interested in the source code. But what you um, so what because I modified the database SQL, uh, I was able to write um, logs like this. Um, wait. So um, I was able to lock out things like when I release a connection, when I set. Uh, so then there, there are things like set max idle connection, set max open connection, when we actually open a uh, uh, new connection. So, right, and then uh, when um, we mark it for deletion and so on, right? So when you run the program, um, so you can get some kind of uh, analytic logs that looks like this. Okay, so it's uh, a bit tedious, but basically this is a Unix uh, timestamp up to nanosecond. And then you be, there'll be events that uh, are gonna list it here. So for, for now, uh, we will try to get some information on uh, certain events. So the first one is do work. So this is where I, um, in the main program, I will um, ask it to um, write to insert a uh, entry. So do work is basically this function, and it will just insert a uh, entry into a table, and uh, when it's done, then it will say it's finished, just sim simply as that. Then at the same time, um, so then it's finished, then you will see something like this. And then in the middle, then it need to open a connection. So we'll track something uh, particular here. So PQ open, open a direct TCP connection. And then uh, there's this uh, put connection. So I see two PQ opens there, they are concurrent access? Uh, no, um, so these are two, so because I'm gonna run workload with concurrent um, go routine, right. so uh, it definitely won't have enough uh, uh, connection. It will clone um, that. 
and uh, hence you will see multiple PQ open. So at any time we open a TCP connection, then you will see that. And then uh, when we put something back to the free pool, then uh, we will track this uh, event where we append uh, to the free connection pool. <coughs> right. So uh, so I'm gonna. So in the interest of time, then I have pre-generated a few set of workload and um, I'm gonna show the graph first and then uh, we're gonna try to run some live thing later. Right. So uh, just take a note of the <coughs> um, file so it tell you what it does. So for example, here we run a sample uh, one-time workload, basically spinning up um, a thousand go routine and uh, send <coughs> a thousand uh, do work requests to the DB. So you see a big spy at the beginning. Uh, I have a few more similar. Uh, let me try uh, this S same thing, but we just send three thousand at the beginning. So this is looks um, more uh, oh, wow. clear. Do, do, okay. Right. So uh, the blue is the do work event. So this is when we ask the DB to insert. The uh, when it's finished, then we'll see an orange line, which is not very. Uh, s s Prominent, like it's somewhere here. Like you can see some orange thing here. Uh, not a lot. Um, then uh, the red, pink color thing is when we open DB connection, and uh, here we open a lot of them because we didn't. When I start this program, I set the open connection limit to zero, basically no limit. So it just <laughs> run free range, and because it run free range, uh, the DB was not able to cope with it. Hence, uh, there was some event here that I tracked also. So it just say um, it can't insert because there's no more connection. So we track that using the black color line. So and then you see it rising um, somewhere at the bottom at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and here to let it keep. So after the initial phase where um, it successfully insert a few stuff then it will start yielding the connection error and this is particular bad after you get the big uh, you get the big spike right so this is one this is the same graph at uh, different resolution so just to see it better i mean so this is pretty expected and um because we don't have any limit right so uh, a more um useful one this would be more like a standard workload so i ran a sustained workload with uh, a limit of 20 open connection and uh, there's this uh, multiplier so basically how many of uh, go routine with respect to the open that i'm running so 20 by 0 0.5 mean 10 go routine so this will send uh right request every 50 millisecond and uh over the duration of 30 seconds. Oh, you're throttling, you're throttling the interval or throttling the number of Um Both. Yeah. Um, so I can configure that. Um, so, I mean, this this would be very uh, typical to something that you run with a web server. Right? You get a constant stream of requests. Um, so as you can see, we only open, the, the ping light is again, number of connections we open. We only open a lot at the beginning, but uh, still within the, our limit and then uh, I think it's not 20 yet so later it opened a bit more right and then uh, uh, that's that's all like it's gonna uh, it's gonna open and there is no error so again just standard stuff that you would expect um, this work fine even when I crank it up to uh, two times the number of go routine so I'm running 40 go routine in this case again at 50 millisecond interval and uh, over 30 seconds just pumping right request it's still pretty safe so um <coughs> i mean this is pretty uh basic like, i i won't draw any conclusion to it and like the conclusion would be obvious that you don't want to um let it run free range like always limit the connection um but the technique like modifying the, the driver and locking this data can be used to understand the behavior 
uh, in different scenario. Like you can track um, maybe like memory usage. Um, I don't know. I mean that there's al already profiler, but other things like um, how often does it clean up connection? Like so you can tune your idle limit, for example. <coughs> All right. Um, so let's try to run some real workload here. Um, right. So. Um, so let's. So gonna remove everything. Um, so we'll run. Um, let me see. Hmm. Right. So we run a sustained workload of uh, over. Let's say uh, 50 connection with uh, 10 idle uh, connection over 30 seconds with an interval of uh, fif again 50 milliseconds between uh, database write and uh, right and I think that's uh, and then let's try to. Uh, Crank it up to uh, four times the workload. Right. So, so it's gonna chunk out data, so we can see. Let me make sure that I don't kill my laptop. So it's gonna be a drought thirty second to write on this thing down. <coughs> right. Um and then uh let's draw some charge on this. So uh right. So this is a bit hard to look, so let's try a different resolution. So are you gonna use uh, 100, 500 milliseconds as aggregation? Mm. Right. So this would be that same thing but uh, different resolution mm -hmm. so again uh, so hmm. we did open quite a bit of connection but at the same time we are also freeing them and um, if we look at the stack um, of that uh, hmm. So um, I take liberty to grab out the stat lock. So I, the database SQL also provide you with a DB stat uh, function, the stat function that provide um, like how many connection is using. So we never really exceed fifty, but uh, looking at the graph, then you would see that uh, we kind of open and uh, free a lot of connection. So in practice, this behavior might not be good for your application because every time you open something that is latency, right? So uh, like running some analysis on that would turn out to be helpful. All right. So uh, so that is why. All right. So 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 far, then um, we have seen the behavior at uh, a big bit bigger scale uh, like I, I'm sure you guys have 
higher scale than this and um, it will be behaving differently right but uh, the rule of thumb for that would draw from this at least would be uh, always set uh, max open connection so you don't run into uh, the case I, like what, what we have like failure because um, the DB cannot cope um, and um, try I, I mean you can use some technique to to um, do to help with capacity planning so right. max open connections is not set by default uh, no it's yeah it's I free by default Ooh. right so yeah right and then uh, some tuning will help with the application right so uh, earlier we have cover about um, like driving your own uh, driver um, your conversion function for your custom type so this is it again uh, it just help clean up the code base uh, and then uh, I think another question that usually come up when we talk about database uh, like SQL code in Go is uh, whether to use an ORM or not um, so try gonna try to address it today too um, so I I started with Ruby and Rails so one of the very natural first thing I do in Go was trying to uh, find an ORM and try to write my own ORM it didn't turn out well I think over time uh, I reverted back but I think um, the basic problem that comes about like that trigger people to to ask for ORM is that um, you don't want to write lots of code because um, one piece would be marshalling data back and forth the other part is uh, you need to generate um, query that almost look like the same but um, it just operate on different table different data type so the first one um, is kind of solved with the custom conversion function um, you just shell it into some other file and just forget about it right and then the second one um, so this is my personal opinion is that uh, when you use ORM, you're effectively trying to generate um, SQL using some syntactical rule and uh, it will be very hard because SQL is a ex very expressive language you, um, that you can really generate on the enumeration in a short amount of time. Like most you will end up something like Rails where um, you have um, certain query patterns and if you keep using it, then you end up um, following that same mental path and you will not be able to make use of functionality of the database. For example, um, like if you use something um, like some ORM out there right now for Go, you might not be able to make use of the enum feature in um, the Postgres database, for example. And uh, that might be helpful if you are sharing your data with other people. And then there'll be other things like material view, um, joy, like multiple level of joy, and so on. That, so you can optimize a lot with, within SQL itself, and uh, using RM will dismiss that chance. Right. Um, so for me, I would say um, you would probably use a few patterns only. So try to optimize that, run uh, the raw query. Uh, you can prepare the query for efficiency. Uh, but don't take my word for it, like experiment and, and try, right? So uh, I think um, that's, that's it for me. I think a lot of things we haven't covered, like we haven't really actually walked through the whole database source code. The fact is it, it is incredibly complex inside. Um, then uh, we haven't really looked at uh, performance, um, like memory usage and so on, um, be besides just the DB connection thing. Right. And then um, uh, we haven't really seen how the DB connection uh, get free as well. So I and as well the um, failure handling. So I don't think we have enough time for that. But uh, I'll leave a few link. Um, um, like if you want to dig, there's always a source code, and then um, there's a few uh, <coughs> link that you can use. So, so some you can like for me, I start by writing. Um, my own kind of like DB drivers and understand it a bit more um, and uh, then uh, there's a few interesting stuff like this uh, SQL mock from uh, Datadog so you can effectively mock out the DB so that you can test um, then uh, if you drive your own driver for example um, to different say um, um, 
different kind of uh, database that may be similar to SQL because the interface of SQL is just query and argument. So maybe um, even maybe graph database might be possible or you can try to write so something like um, Google Cloud Spanner that just came out, for example. Um, so you can use um, the facility that uh, in this Go SQL test. So this is developed by one of the Go team member to test out your driver. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, then you need to understand the protocol that you con that you use to connect with the backend database. Uh, Mark, I'm actually more interested in um, how you handle uh, mm. request part. Right. Do you, do you have a short circuit, circuit breaker mechanism in front of your database, or you set max connections and use errors as a short, as a circuit breaker mechanism? Um, I think. Let's say you have a no, okay. huge spike, you know the database can't handle it. Right. Do you limit the spike or mm. do you dedicate the database, set max connections, okay. let errors tell you to circuit break? The okay. Um, I think it depends on how you write the code also. So if your code doesn't know how to handle, like it always assumes the good path and doesn't know to how, how to handle uh, a spike error, right. then um, you better add some circuit breaker before the code. Um, if you know that, uh, um, I mean, if you are fine with returning uh, 500, 400 uh, from the service, when you see a database failure, then I think yeah, that's fine. I'm trying to understand the motivation behind this. Because I do a lot of database queries as mm. well. Uh, my, my services are very small, so they come nowhere near to hitting the limits of the database. Right. So I never ever actually face these issues in production, right. but I like to gain insights for people like you who run it at scale. How do you handle problems like this? Do you circuit break at the database level or circuit break at the application level? Right. I think um, I do both. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, we usually we try to uh, rate limit at the API, the front end server level. Ah. Right. So that's, that's the first defense. Uh, the database. Right. So it, it, in worst case, if it flows through, and then uh, you you see a lot of error, maybe you can circuit break within the service itself to drop the health check yeah, and, and uh, stop requests from it. To understand your workload better, is it a mainly write workload or mainly read workload? Um, I have both. Um, so I mean, because of the way we write the app, so some of the path is um, read heavy, but they still go to the DB. And it's not, um, it's not possible to cache that yet because we need consistent data. Uh, so, so I mean, it's just because we we have some design problem. It's not, but it, it led to this thing, right? The best the best way is um, so you need the asset database. Yeah. So I mean, something that provide uh, consistency, like hundred percent guarantee. So I still need that, and hence the simplest solution for us right now would uh, be um, going to direct to, to DB. So but it's not you ideal. Have a, a single Postgres database. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, at the yeah. heart of the operation. Yeah. At, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So I think, anyway, so that's on. Uh, I think later on, uh, there might be some details on uh, Go 1.8 change to the basic Go, which you should hear about. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not the, that. Uh, I'm not doing code that. Doesn't talk. Break my code. Uh, but uh, do, do check it out. There's a lot of positive, positive change on that. Right. And uh, with that, I would uh, like to end my talk.